Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Lithgow. Um, on behalf of everyone who organized uh, this, uh, this week's Educational Technologies, I just want to welcome you to our fourth annual um, Educational Technologies Week. Before we begin today's program, um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran Neutral, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee people. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, and that's the land that was promised to the Six Nations and includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. So we have a great um, lineup of sessions for you this week. We're going to begin with our keynote presentation on transformative learning and the potential of digital technologies. And that's going to be followed by a number of sessions on really informative and interesting topics such as Sharp Scholar, Lightboard, Virtual Reality, Gamification, Open Educational Resources, and of course uh, PebblePad to introduce our new um, ePortfolio and Learning Journey uh, platform. Form. Of course, I haven't listed all of the sessions, but each session is, um, we hope that you are going to be introduced to educational technologies that will help you do things differently, but maybe even more importantly, do different things that will help enhance your students' learning. A lot of advanced planning goes in um, to making this session possible, and I just want to take a moment to thank my colleagues who were um, just so integral to helping put this together. So we have Mark Morton, who did most of the organizing for this. We've got Verna Keller, we have Maris Weiss, and we have our co-op students, um, Maggie, Sarah, and uh, Zuri who will, you'll probably see throughout the week. You'll probably also see Elisa Sivek. She'll be popping in and out, taking pictures of sessions, and we use this for our annual report or some of our other um, advertising materials. Um, and so finally, if you're interested in social media, we also have a hashtag set up for uh, UW EdTech 2019. So I hope you enjoy the week. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to pass the stage over now to our Associate Vice President, Academic. Here he is. <laughs> Mario. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Canelli, and as uh, Catherine has told you, I'm Associate VP Academic. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our presentation uh, to CTE's fourth annual Educational Technologies Week and Ian Peary to deliver the keynote address. With nearly four decades of experience as a full-time educator, Dr. Peary has led the development of innovative programs in a variety of disciplinary areas and that includes art, design, uh, computer science, engineering, architecture and so on. He's known internationally as uh, an examiner, quality assurance reviewer, and an advisor, and has been to such interesting places as uh, Malaysia, Singapore, China, Sri Lanka, United Arab Emirates, New Zealand, Australia, the list goes on and on. And of course, he's done extensive work in the UK and the European, the EU. For a considerable period of time, his research has explored the use of current and emerging digital technologies in both design practice and in supporting specific pedagogical approaches in education. And this research aligns very nicely with the focus of Educational Technologies Week. Ian was the Assistant Principal for Learning and Development at the University of Edinburgh from 2011 to 2015 and is now Emeritus Professor of Design and a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy UK. His keynote presentation today, entitled Transformative Learning and the Potential of Digital Technologies, is quite relevant to Waterloo's focus on moving from a teaching paradigm to a learning paradigm. In addition, Ian will be talking about student-led, independently created courses, or known as SLICs, and the use of PebblePad to facilitate them. And that is also very timely, because this week there are, there are four workshops on PebblePad as we prepare to uh, continue that work in its um, now second term. Thanks to Catherine. Ian, we are looking forward to your presentation on transformative learning and the potential of digital technologies. Thank you very much, Maria. Okay, can you hear me all? Yeah? 
coming across. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine and, and Mario, uh, for the welcome and organization for, for this event. We're delighted to be here. I was saying to, to Catherine a little earlier, um, I was on a quality assurance review in Glasgow last week, and it, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure when I arrived, but I think it was Saturday. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for, for coming along this morning. I think what I'd like to do, first of all, is just to give you a, a little run-through of the structure of the keynote. There's a little interactive bit that I'd like you to participate in right from the beginning. And for those that know me, I never pounce on anyone in the first row. It's always the back row. <laughs> so, but uh, if you could participate in that, that would be helpful, and we'll, we'll see some of the output from this uh, uh, as we go through. But although we're going to talk about the use of technologies, I'm going to take the story back to about 2007, when I was at uh, Edinburgh College of Art, and the students in art design and architecture there were really struggling with um, assessment and feedback in particular. And this is not unusual, it's not uncommon in, in the visual arts and, and the performing arts, primarily because we want students to come up with unique solutions for every project or every brief they're on. So there's no fixed, fixed way of actually getting to this end solution. And so this was, of course, frustrating students no end in terms of trying to understand their assessment. And the reason, I'll come on to the reason about assessment and feedback being the starting point, but essentially it's the foundation uh, for independent learners. And I understand that Waterloo is keen to move to a more learner-focused uh, pedagogic model, and you have to get the assessment and feedback piece solid in terms of the foundation in order that students can then be independent learners. But the students themselves, in the model that I'll show you, are self-assessing. So they're self-assessing against criterion, against learning outcomes, and unless they understand this at quite a, a reasonable or deep level, then it's not possible. It just it wouldn't work. So before explaining a little bit more about the keynote structure, if I could ask you, if you have mobile devices with you, should work on any device. If you have a QR code reader, just snap the QR code. If you don't, go to the website menti.com and Type in, once you get to the website, type in the 876607 code, which it will ask you to do. And a word of caution, you can only submit the answer once. So think carefully about what answer you're going to give uh, in the questions around assessment. The keynote has far too many slides, so it's a health warning. Absolutely far too many. But there's a reason for this, is once we get on to the, to the self-designed learning of the students, I've got examples of their outputs that the students graciously said, yes, that's fine, you can use my name and, and use the outputs to, to let colleagues see. And, but, of course, it's screen grabs of Pebblepad and the output of the students. So you won't be able to read in detail a lot of this material. Therefore, I'll, I'll go through these slides quite quickly because you'll have a link. Uh, and the presentation will be available to you subsequently. You'll be able to go through the detail of the student outputs. So it's really just to give you a flavor and feel for the range of material that the students uh, produce in, in this particular model. Okay, so everyone okay with that part? Make a note? Right. So, Structure of the presentation, we cover assessment feedback, digital technologies, creating independent learners, and then finally we get to the, to the self-designed learning. And importantly, why um, start with assessment and feedback, portfolio pedagogy, digital literacy, and then learning. In order for the self-designed model to, to work well, all of these elements need to be in place. And the question about why starting with uh, assessment and feedback, the assessment criteria for students to, to cope with self-designed learning, they really need to understand where they are with assessment criteria. And that self-measurement is very, very difficult for students to, to understand. And we'll, we'll unpack this as we go through. So the learning outcomes, standards calibration, self-assessment and peer assessment are all part of this model of pushing pushing the self-assessment um, envelope, if you like. Feedback 
uh, again, there are issues around feedback for, for students, and students, it's an area, as you'll see in a moment, within the UK, that students uh, consistently across the whole sector, across every university, uh, say they have difficulties with, despite, I, I might add, despite best, best efforts from staff. And what's important about the assessment uh, design is that there are a number of ways of using assessment uh, at university. And if assessment is used correctly, it will it'll help students. It's part of their learning rather than simply uh, part of their measuring of the standards. So the issues around assessment and feedback. The National Student Survey across the UK, is that something that's it's known to, to folks in terms of national surveys in general? Well, this next graph shows 10 years worth of data uh, on 2007 to 2016 uh, analysis of the National Student Survey. Uh, anyone want to guess where assessment and feedback sits in the, in the graph? So this W at the bottom, I mean, which I think what's really interesting about this is now you're talking about 10 different cohorts, graduating cohorts of students who don't know each other from every discipline, from every university in the country. And the graph is identical as it moves from 2007 to 2016. The good news is that it would appear that the UK sector are improving a little bit in terms of assessment and feedback. So the W is uh, rising rising up a little bit. But if you have a look at the questions that are being asked here for the students, it's the five, six, seven, eight, nine section. That's where the graph for the W that the students are most concerned about. And these are the questions. Feedback on my work has been prompt. I have received detailed comments on my work. And feedback on my work has helped me clarify things I did uh, or I didn't or did not understand. And this is what that looks like in 2007. Assessment criteria, the five and six question, isn't quite so bad. So students understood the criteria for the assessment, but the feedback certainly wasn't helping them, or the kind of feedback they were receiving really didn't help them. And generally, they seem to think that the assessment arrangements for the organization of assessment is, is sort of OK. But you'll see in, in the graph, as we look at that screen again, that there's it's, it's definitely a dip by comparison to everything else. And what's really interesting to me is if you look at the left hand, your, your left column here, the, when the students are refle reflecting on this in the NSS, their tutors, their instructors are highly regarded. So in Edinburgh, we can have, I won't name the departments, but you can have situations where the NSS will have 100% satisfaction for a department. Would you recommend this course to your friends? Absolutely, it's fantastic. How are your instructors? They're amazing, they're brilliant. 43% in assessment and feedback. Same students. So this disconnect is, is really slight, is slightly concerning in terms of well, how, what, what's going on that they can see their, their, their academics are wonderful, their teaching is wonderful, everything else in terms of the resources and so on, they, they like. But this issue around assessment and feedback is a bit of a problem uh, for them. Um, so, assessment. And we'll have, have a look at where we are here. So, unsurprisingly, there, there's no wrong answer, of course, in the, the question set that I asked of you. And 11 and 28, to ensure all learning outcomes have been met and to help students learn uh, pretty much exactly what I would expect uh, this group to be close to. As I say, there's no wrong answer. So, the institution needs... Um, to demonstrate their academic standards. We need to uh, ensure that all learning outcomes are being met and uh, measure the academic performance of students and help students learn. Um, again, it'll come as no surprise to you, I hope, that to help students learn normally is the highest bar chart. And I'll explain, if I can get back to my other slides, why that's, uh, why that's quite important for us. Sometimes this works a little bit more easily on the twin screen. Okay. 
So, in terms of the primary purpose of assessment, for, for many years, certainly as far back as I can remember, we, we of course, were required to ensure that we can return grades or marks uh, to the centre of the university for record-keeping purposes, to, to demonstrate that the students have sat the assessments and they've been assessed and the standards are being maintained. But designing assessment to measure only really misses the point of helping students learn. And if you look at this, this is a, an extract from, I think this is the assessment handbook for Edinburgh College of Art in terms of the statements. So there's the university, the instructors and the students. And these are the, the three categories, if you like, that assessment feeds into. However, if you um, design assessment for the students, automatically it will deal with the requirements of the institution and the instructors. So, and, and it seems such an easy thing to do, but you can design assessment for measurement, it doesn't help the students at all. You can design assessment to help students learn, and you will deal with the measurement because it's automatic. You still have, you still have assessed the students. But the, the assessment design then becomes really quite important. So the issue is if we design assessment to help students learn and keep that as a focus, particularly if you desire to move towards independent uh, learning for students, then everything else will take care of itself. And we'll, we, we can have a look at how, how that works. These categories then of assessment of learning, assessment for learning, and assessment as learning, if you design assessment for learning, top one will take care of itself. And when we get to independent learning in terms of self-designed learning, we can add the assessment as, le as learning. Now what I'd like to do for the next part is just to have a little bit of fun with current issues with assessment. Generally, this is a type of feedback that we will get across the sector fairly consistently um, in the universities that it fails to meet student expectations to some degree. Uh, as I say, it's getting a bit better. It can drive the wrong behaviours, and I'm sure you're very well aware of that, that students can become fixated on strategic learning and simply move, work towards what they believe will get them the best uh, grades or results rather than focusing on the learning. Um, there can be resistance to change, and often that resistance is because, well, we've always done it this way, and we're not sure what we should change it to, and if we change it to something that's worse, then that's not, not helpful. So you, that's quite natural that there would be some anxieties a, a, around um, assessment design. There can also be institutional barriers and obsessions particularly about aggregation, and we'll come on to that in a minute. You know, we need a single mark for everything the students have done, by GPA or whatever. All of that's possible, by the way, if we design assessment to, to help students learn. So the assessment challenges for, for us and for our students is that explicit clarity and purpose of assessment, what the goal of assessment is, and developing assessment literacy in students, and that's it's easier than it, it might sound. It just means, in a way, I was thinking about this the other day, how to frame this, teach them to be teachers. So if you, if you design experiences for your students so that they're teaching others, senior students, teaching junior students, and so on, um, they very quickly uh, will, will begin to understand to a deeper level uh, their own, their own uh, education. Importantly, students taking ownership of and reflecting upon their own assessment and taking responsibility for learning. So challenges with current approaches, and this is hopefully a fun section. So it's early in the morning, but we'll just uh, um, we'll try and, and get the principles across, but hopefully in an amusing way. Familiar branding, reasonable and. Okay, I wasn't going to change it because the 57 is useful. So the 57 varieties. Here we are in Waterloo on the left-hand side, UK sector. This was a proposal to get a unified uh, marking grid for the sector in terms of GPA. And you can see, you can see immediately for students um, that this might be slightly confusing. 
So it's certainly confusing for students coming from the UK if they want to spend a semester in Canada, and it's definitely confusing for students when they come to the UK. And st uh, staff will say to students, what do you mean you're not happy with your 62? That's uh, perfectly fine. And uh, nobody ever gets higher than 65, but we'll, we'll come to that. So numbers, reliability, and aggregation. Issues with numbers. So as you can see here immediately, so in the UK, 71, excellent, well done. Now, as far as the instructor is concerned, they've given the student a really good mark because we never mark higher than 76 because that's genius level. So 71 is absolutely fine. Um, but of course, that's different. For you guys, it's going to be 85. So 85, well done, terrific, uh, nice work. So this is an issue for our students because we, in the main, tend not to spend much time explaining all of this of what's going on. So in the UK, a 62 on an essay means that it's, um, it's a low 2-1. So it's okay, it's above average, it's not a first, it's not a star. And the member of staff carries this around in their head, in the humanities. Why are we using numbers in humanities? Why are we using a number on an essay? But anyway, that's... Uh, how it is, symbolic use of numbers loaded with hidden meaning, and of course it will change department by department, discipline by discipline, and so on. So we forget to explain this to our students. Do we need to use numbers? We could use anything. It doesn't really, it isn't, seriously, you know, for your essay you've got a banana. You don't know if that's, uh, <laughs> or not. We're not sure, is, is that okay? Well, it's okay if we explain to the student what the banana means, you know, so that's fine. So, do we really need a um, 100% scale? Zero to 100, that's very fine. And if I challenge my humanities colleagues and say, oh, you give them 67 for the essay, where did they lose the marks from 100? You know, precisely where in the essay did you reduce back to 67, or how did you build the marks up to 67? Very difficult for them to give me an answer. Meanwhile, our students, bless them, they're quite happy. They've got a student grade scale, which is A, I thought I did that rather well, I'm quite pleased with myself. That's the criterion. Uh, B is pretty good, but it could have been better. C, it was okay, I suppose shrug over the shoulder, and D, it was awful. Students, once they get to satisfactory, plummet. They can't really um, say, well, some bits were good. They, they get to satisfactory, and then it was just a, an absolute disaster. So, the, so now we've got four points on the student scale. Um, the instructor agrees that it was awful, and says, yeah, totally, I agree with you, it was an F. Student response, I didn't think it was that bad. You know, so, so we... So we're down to about four kind of major bandings, even if you have numbers in there of, of categories, if you like, of that above average, the you know, very good, the above average, and the, it was okay, and then beginning to be below average. So numbers gives us problems, uh, and grades. It doesn't really have too many of them. So it's the scale. How many points in the scale can be challenging? Um, Consensus, so if we're double-blind marking, so colleagues marking uh, with each other, but they're not um, communicating quite correctly. You might recognize this, yeah. So in the art schools, instructor one, I like it. Fabulous use of color. Instructor two, bit dull, rather obvious, seen it all before. So um, an aggregated grade in the middle which no instructor gave them, by the way, is because of this lack of understanding between, in this case, between the two markers. You know, so we, uh, yes, it's, we're looking at the same piece of artwork in this case, but we have no shared understanding of what it is we're actually assessing in that piece. Now, if, if we're not doing that, between essays or dissertations, doesn't matter what it is, if we're not doing that, then how on earth can we expect our students to understand what they've achieved and what they've uh, uh, arrived at? For those of you that know a little bit about Vincent's background, of course, throughout his entire life, he was considered a failure. And then after he died, uh, then we got the assessment criteria right. It took us a wee while. And uh, he was an A star. So, and in the art schools, it's not 
I've heard this more than once in my career. Well, it's either a fail or they're a genius. So when it's, when it's right out at the extremes, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. So this sharing of understanding between the instructors, absolutely critical and paramount. The purpose and focus of the assessment itself, what it is, an assessment can, we could look at the artwork, going back to Vincent for a moment, we could look at that, be, but be assessing different things. And we need to know at any point in time what it is we're actually assessing and what this is evidencing. So that lack of explicit assessment criteria and shared understanding, really, really, really important that you spend time with each other and then subsequently with your students on day one of any start of a new program or course or assignment and spend time. That is not time wasted. That is valuable time spent with, with your uh, students. Now, obsession with aggregation. And this is certainly in the UK. It's when, when online systems and record keeping all went digital and databases and all of that. All of a sudden, we need, we need a number. We need just a single number. Computers generally don't do too well with letters. It's actually not true because you can put numbers behind the letters. But the, we want to record a number. And, of course, what that was interpreted to was having a single number to represent the student's entire academic journey. And that's not necessarily too clever. And we'll have a look at why. I hope, so I was saying to Catherine earlier, I hope you recognize some of the, the folks in this one. Do you recognize her? Yeah, OK. So learning outcome one, under the category of communication, ICT, and numeracy, numeracy skills, demonstrate your ability to effectively communicate your strategic aims. Not so much. <laughs> really, um, not so much. A bit, con bit confusing. Very clear. So the communication is absolutely crystal clear. Clear Brexit means Brexit. But um, after that, it's gone a bit fuzzy for the, for the last uh, few years. Nonetheless, she's been very consistent, very clear. So I reckon that's probably OK. 79. I'll put that <laughs> um, Learning outcome two, generic cognitive skills, exercise contextual judgment in critical selection. Well done. Yeah, I couldn't, that's an excellent choice. <laughs> it's an uh, excellent choice. I couldn't really, I'll go back and just let you see that. Yeah, no, this is, this is definitely the one that we, we would choose over here. Can't fault that uh, judgment. So that's definitely a 95. Learning outcome three. <laughs> Practice applied knowledge and skills and understanding. Demonstrate your ability to put theory and simulation into practice. Now, it might have been fine on the Xbox and the PlayStation. <laughs> Not so much once we got into the real world. So that's, that's definitely a bit, but you know, they tried. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the space, it's just that the, the space was a, a little bit too, too tight, maybe, for the, for the BMW. <laughs> so, what does that turn into? We've got learning outcome one, outcome two, outcome three, 73. 73, very good, well done. <laughs> now, obviously, we would never compile those types of learning outcomes together, necessarily. However, do we really need to aggregate it at all? Well, the answer is no, we don't. Because what we need to know is that they were pretty poor at the applying the skills. They were OK at bits of the communication. And when they were going out to shop for um, definitely the, the jam to go on the croissant, then it was the maple syrup that was going to win out. So it conceals actual performance if we're not careful about how we explain and put together the, the learning outcomes. And actually, Again, we could use anything, including the apples, cherries, and bananas, to say to the student, this is where you are. Now, what's much more important to the student than the number or the aggregated number? That's fine for the measuring assessment, and that's fine for the record keeping in the institution in the university. N none of that's a problem. It's only a problem for the student, because we've compiled it and divided and aggregated. And it's not helpful for the student to understand where their strengths are, where they, where they need to improve. So I would advocate, and we, you certainly for um, self-designed learning, you need to think about these profiles of, and we'll see in a moment, profiles of learning where students are, um, can see exactly 
quite explicitly what they're good at, what they need to work on, and so on. So for most cases, until you get near the end of their career at university, providing you give a, a graded or, or marked assessment profile, students like to know where they are. So they don't like, they don't like actually getting... I did some work with the Conservatoire in, in Scotland and Glasgow, and the staff were keen for first and second year junior students to move to a pass-fail. Students don't like pass-fail because that doesn't tell them where they, how they're getting on. And generally, students just want to know, am I doing okay? Do I, you know, am I doing okay here and, and need to work harder and so on? So the, but for the university recording, a pass for the course is absolutely fine, providing you've got this profile, a more detailed profile and, uh, of record of how the students are working. Now, within um, UK and Europe and Scotland uh, a little bit earlier, we've had national frameworks. And those national frameworks um, will, when I was saying about those learning outcomes, very different. These were real learning outcomes, uh, not, not so much the evidence with, uh, with the Prime Minister, but the real learning outcomes taken from the characteristics of learning. So these characteristics of learning make up uh, level one, level two, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, postgraduate and doctoral study, this is first year, uh, at the university. Now these are written in generic terms and discipline by discipline you will then reinterpret those categories and build that into your, to your discipline area of study. So that diversity of learning outcomes do exist. So it's not just about building the knowledge in the subject or even applying the knowledge in the subject. It's the other wider learning that we expect students in terms of their professional and graduate attributes to, to develop while they're with us at university. And these learning profiles, if you, if you work in this way rather than the single, single numbers, can be really helpful uh, in the sense that over time, over time, we can see, this is an example from um, coursework-based assignments, where the learning outcomes one, two, three, four, and five, mirroring the national framework, over time, if you're tracking the student's performance in this way, which you can do now on online systems, very difficult to do, impossible to do, actually, paper-based, but now this is much easier to do. Um, tracking online, you can then see where the students are consistently low, or improving across time, or dipping across time. And this can give you information that might, there may be some problem that's got nothing to do with their academic work, but something happening outside the institution. In which case, you can be alert to the fact that the student's performance is a bit, a bit odd at a certain point in their study. So this sort of tracking of progress uh, during um, their semesters is really quite, quite important. So this then feeds directly into, you know, that, uh, that chart here feeds directly into the ability to align the learning, the learning design with what's expected in terms of the wider learning characteristics. Now, learning outcomes are problems with learning outcomes. Um, they're, not, they're not easy. And a colleague of mine in Kingston uh, University, uh, Susan, we were both in a keynote at one point, <laughs> and Susan, this was Susan's view on it. The problem with them is that the only person that understands them um, is the person that wrote them. And, and, that, and that's the same between instructors and their colleagues. So if I've written a course, then I need to work hard to explain those to my colleagues that are teaching with me. And more importantly, our students need to understand them. So this troubled me for a bit. And then we, um, we thought, well, if we're moving towards more student centered uh, focus, how could we, how could we ad begin to address this issue? And we came up with this notion, and this is the one that's used in the slicks when we get to the independent learning, is that when you write the learning outcomes, they, they may be written um, as clear as you can write them, but they might still sound a bit academic. They might. You know, it depends on what your institution requires you to do for your course descriptors. And students will stumble at that, that very first hurdle. If they do not understand the learning outcomes properly, they certainly will not understand their assessment of them and what you're trying to get them to demonstrate. So what we did in the slicks is the students 
rewrite the learning outcomes. They put them into their own, not rewrite them, they put them into their own words. And the instructor then approves, as part of their proposal of study, approves whether or not they, their understanding, whether what they've written aligns with what you are trying to get them to learn. It's a very simple thing to do. So it's a day one of a new assignment or a new task. This is how you're going to be assessed. This is what we're trying to get you to learn. So these are the learning outcomes, learning objectives. Work in pairs or work in small groups and, and write down what you think they mean in the context of the project. And that simple exercise will take the, take the students further forward. So assessment is, of course, and as it should be, it's dependent on academic judgment. At the end of the day, you're still assessing your students and they've met the standards that you're setting for them. They, ha they have or they have not. But it must be based on the ability to make this really clear to students. There's a shared clarity between the, the team of staff that are teaching them, a clear understanding of the purpose of the specific assessment. The assessment will have different purposes at different stages of, of the student's uh, education and also the assignment in hand. And you must be able to clearly communicate these to students, really important. I think what I'll do here is have a glass of water. Any questions as we move on to feedback? Please shout out. I'll have some water. Uh, you showed us a framework for first year, uh, first year undergraduates. Do you have that same, a similar framework yes. for graduates? Yes, it's all online. I'll give you the, the links for that. It's the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework, um, SCQF. And there's the, uh, have the English one, European frameworks as well. So that I can give you the links to two or three different frameworks. Um, okay, feedback. Challenges again with the traditional approaches to feedback. And this is what we're, we're going to cover in the next section. Frequently expressed by students, again from the, the various studies and surveys of the, of the NSS. I rarely get feedback. I never get feedback when I need it, and I don't understand my feedback. So staff in disciplines such as architecture and design in the art schools, they will then say, I am constantly speaking to, to my students, all the time. The students don't recognize that as feedback. That's a conversation with my, my instructor or my tutor, not feedback. So the, the poor member of staff is saying, I'll always be speaking to them, and, but, it's, but that's not feedback. F feedback for the student, uh, there has to be a certain formality around it. However, whether it's a verbal or written uh, between the two, for this, for, basically you have to say to the student, you are now receiving feedback. <laughs> and she said, you know, right, feedback bulb has gone on and uh, we are now dealing with feedback. Now, I personally have, I'm sorry, <laughs> the cameraman at the back thumped the mic. Um, I personally have a little bit of a, a, a problem with the concept of students as customers. And it's not that we don't love our students dearly, but they are students. Customers have no responsibilities. Customers can go to a shop, if you don't like the shop, you go to another shop and buy the same or different product. Um, so the analogy breaks down very quickly. When students are, once they've signed up, might be a, you know, they might be a customer at the point they're looking for their education and so on, but once they're, they're here, they have responsibilities. And unless students recognize that they have responsibilities for their own learning, we're not going to move very far with them. And so this is, again, feedbackforlearning.org. Again, many cartoons around this topic, you know, engage of what's in it for us. Um, it's not one-sided. So at the beginning of, certainly at the beginning of a university uh, uh, program, right at the outset with new students, it's worthwhile spending time with students saying, this is what we're responsible for and this is what you can expect from us. You can write it down, put it in the handbook, doesn't matter, as long as they know. And in return, this is what we expect of you as the student. And that expectation, that partnership, has to be formed from the very beginning. And it has to occur through every single course or module or program at their institution. And the reason I say that is that in Ed Edinburgh has a big liberal arts program. So students can be all over the university in different schools and different departments studying different bits of their degree. And 
what really frustrates, frustrates them is when they have different practices that don't appear sensible. They don't mind understanding why they do it differently in chemistry from art history, that's fine, but in terms of the assignment. But if it's not explained to them why the differences are there, then it, it becomes a point of frustration around when will I get my feedback or what kind of feedback and how will I receive the feedback and so on. So the staff view, frequently expressed by academics, constantly speaking to them, I provide comprehensive uh, feedback on their work and I'm not sure in some cases they don't, if it's, if it's a collecting system, if it's in the school office, students won't bother to come and collect it or they don't read it and they don't act upon it. What the students would like is the, the feedback to be timely, constructive, personalized and understandable. And what still happens for feedback is it's no feedback, late feedback, disconnected, eligible still, you know, still handwritten. And I would be guilty of that being left-handed. My writing's absolutely appalling, so I could never give handwritten feedback to a student because they just wouldn't be able to read it. So that's not, not good. And unhelpful feedback in terms of you know, feedback that means something to you when you wrote it. That's, this is a terrible piece of work. Um, <laughs> there's no point in telling the student it's a terrible piece of work because that's really not going to help them. So feedback that is comment and as opposed to constructive, uh, it just frustrates students even more. So if we say things to, to our students, it's poor referencing, it's poorly struck, lack of really weak analysis and so on, that all means things to us. But unless the student understands precisely what you mean, if the student knew that it was poorly referenced, then they would have probably tried to fix it. Or if, or, or, or if, you know, if there were light on content and so on. So again, like the learning outcomes, working with students to really understand this is, is critically important. And I think moving from a, a, a teaching focus to learning focused model, this becomes even more important. More time needs to be spent on these sorts of activities um, prior to introducing the, the subject matter. So student engagement, and both of us were in, it happened to be Pebble, the Pebble Bash, which Pebble Pad, were out in, in Melbourne, and this was, went up in the Twitter feed from David Bowd. It isn't feedback unless there's subsequent evidence of its effect. Now, if you think about that in terms of designing your feedback, what does that mean in practice? You know, if you, th if you think I'm giving students feedback. So if I, if I write all my feedback on the margin of the essay, stick a 62 or a 78 or whatever on the bottom, and then put it in a brown envelope or whatever it is and hand it back to the student, it's gone. That's transmission. I have no idea if the student read the feedback, understood the feedback, and did anything, did anything with the feedback. I did my job, the first bit, which was to diligently write the feedback. And here's a mark. If you put, just while I take a slight tangent here, if you give students feedback and a mark on the same piece, same assignment, they'll look at the mark and not bother with the feedback. So just a caution. They keep the two things separately. Um, so what needs to happen, um, we need active engagement with feedback. And I, it's always escaped me why instructors and, and uh, tutors in UK terminology, why they find this tricky, because it's back to, to the partnership with the student. If you say to the students, first year students, day one, this is how our department works, this is what we need you to do, this is what we'll do, this is what we need you to do, it has to be consistent, and all your colleagues have to be joined up because everybody has to agree to do it together, um, then it'll work. It's very difficult if it's different, if there's different expectations as a student uh, has courses in different parts of the university. We'll see in a minute why, how this functions. We need the student to engage with the feedback. We need them to reflect on the feedback that they've been given. We also need explicit evidence that the feedback that we are given to our, giving to our students is having any impact at all. Otherwise, it's, there's no point. There's no point in giving feedback. And importantly, students must understand that they have a responsibility for uh, engaging with feedback, not an option. It's a bit like saying you wouldn't tolerate an a student not turning up to an exam. They're expected to turn up to an exam and sign in, do the exam. If they, if they don't, there's consequences for doing, not turning up 
not sitting their assessment. Feedback needs to be treated in a very similar way. And that's then you'll start to, to change the way things work. Please. Yeah, please, yeah. So uh, responsibility of each student, are there ways you do in the UK that do not um, require currency of grades for their response to encourage their responsibility? Mm. Thank you for the interruption. Perfect. <laughs> and yes, so how do we do it? So, so this is only one model, but it's a model that, that, uh, that works. And this was designed in the context of an e-portfolio learning management system. So this model that you're about to see as a graphic um, is designed into an online system. And which means that the students, I'll explain how it works in the context of that online system. So mutually constructed feedback was a term that I coined along with my colleague Stuart Corner. Um, I was trying to put the date was, it must have been 20, 2009, about 2009 time, around about then, 08 or 09. And this is the model that would function in a design school, but don't worry about that, this the model principles of the model, again, would function uh, everywhere. Project, task, or, or assignment, whatever that coursework is, introduced to the students. At some point, the students will be asked to, in the case of, of uh, visual design, they'll be presenting this, but it could be a presentation or a, a hand-in of the draft submission, whatever that may be. And then there's an interaction at this point. So in design schools, this interaction would be with their peer group and their instructors, the student would have to present uh, where they were with their project. There would then be a, a tutorial, a formal tutorial, and that would be one-to-one -one student instructor or one-to-many. It may be the team of instructors, depending on, on the context. Um, and then where this differs is the next seg segment. The student then reflects upon that, the information that came from the tutorial, that's one thing. The second point is the student writes up their own feedback, not the tutor. So that's there in a big change in a way. If you're constantly doing all of the writing and the transmitting of the information, that in a way lessens its impact. The, the, the student really needs to take the responsibility, providing you've had the discussion with them. Uh, we've tried various methods. You can have I don't know if you come across live scribe pens. There's some, yeah. So where you could record record the, the tutorial, or the student can record the tutorial and then go off with their recording and, and write it up. There's various ways that you can try to, to speed this up in terms of the student then writing up their, their tutorial. Instructors still have to write their own notes, but you, you need to remember what you said to the individual student. So you need to have your action points over here and, and, and a record of that uh, discussion. But this is where it changes from conventional models, is the instructor then sees the student, because it's on the online system, the student has now published their, their uh, feedback they've written up and their action points into the system. Now I can see all of my duties and, and see the uh, feedback that they've written up. And I can approve it as being a, an accurate understanding, a rec an accurate record of the meeting and understanding of what has been said in terms of progressing. If all of that's fine, then you're off on to the next assignment and task and so on. If it's not, then you, you would have to then arrange a, a scheduled a tutorial for the student for that follow-up because they didn't really understand what was said. Um, my colleagues and instructors would say, well, that seems like an awful lot of work. Well, it is for the student because you're passing, that, you have to design the structure for this to happen, but actually all of that work is passing on to the students. You're no longer writing up the big detailed tutorial. You have to have the discussion, which the staff do all the time. In the case, back to my art school, they're always speaking to them, but the students don't see it as, a, as, a, a, as feedback. So building in, this is just an example, but building in that closed loop engaged feedback model doesn't need to be like this because that one, that's specific for art school context, but the principles apply across any discipline. Um, that the students then have to have a responsibility. And it's back to David's point that he made in the Twitter feed and in the same conference then Apparently, I was snapped, as Gail will probably be <laughs> doing at some point. But the Twitter, the Twitter wall then captured this 
comment from myself, which is there needs to be a consequence for the students of receiving feedback. So that's the one to think about. If I'm giving students feedback, what's the consequence for them? Am I going to ask them to, to then reiterate or make up some action points or write a, a, a paragraph and put it onto the, to the learning environment, the online system, and so on? So creating independent learners, so moving this forward. And this is where um, we, we need to get quite a number of these things in place. Assessment literacy, formal responsibilities, structured frameworks for learning, uh, developing core skill sets, professional attributes, and support, supporting uh, a system that supports students getting things wrong. So if we design assessment to always be, it's, if it's punitive in terms of you got it wrong, so you got a bad mark, that's actually not helpful to an iterative learning model. So you have to design the learning so that students um, can get it wrong and take risks, and then the, the innovation will, will move in. So the portfolio pedagogy, if you're moving to um, an e-portfolio model, uh, it doesn't need to be e-portfolio. For some things, the, the online makes it infinitely uh, easier for many disciplines to engage with this particular pedagogy. Um, but essentially, this model enables students, I'm just looking at the time, I'll, I will need to speed up to get into some of the slick territory, um, although we're, we're okay, uh, I think, yet. Um, the only thing that's, if you like, the only thing that's special about the portfolio model is it's gathering evidence over time. And it doesn't matter. So that has been in place in virtually all disciplines in some form or another, whether it's in anatomy classes, keeping, keeping the, the, the record, the weekly record of the courses, or the workbooks in the, in, the, in the labs, or in the science labs, and so on. That essentially is what we're talking about. It's, it's that keeping a record of whatever it needs to be. In the case of the visual arts, of course, it's the creating of, of, of the work. Um, but it's being kept and observed over time. And it's the over time part that's really quite, uh, quite important. So this portfolio itself, whatever is contained within the portfolio, supports this facilitated learning model. And the analogy that I have used for a long time is music. So I, I can't take you into the lecture theater and talk to you about playing the piano and teach you everything I know about playing the piano in an hour and then at the end of the lecture, you can go and play the piano. And everyone say, don't be silly. You can't do that. And I say, well, why not? I've told you everything you need to know. Why can't you play the piano? I have nothing more to say. And of course, say, that's crazy. But I've got to practice. Exactly. Of course, you've got to practice. So this model is about the student's iterative practice, getting things wrong and getting it more right as they move through over time. So the overtime part is important, and we're going to flip through these really quickly. So it's been extensively used in art schools for everything from uh, entry portfolios to get in, to their, um, their sketchbooks that they keep over time, uh, to critiques where they're lined up at the end of the project to present their, their work, to the full-blown assessment. This is the sculpture court at Edinburgh College of Art inside the building. So that's the students preparing for assessment, and the examiners would see all of the work set up. Uh, to this is an assessment, where the external examiners are in the audience looking at the, the catwalk presentation. It's part of the assessment of the fashion students. So at one extreme, the pedagogy well understood um, in the art schools. They couldn't function without it. And then at the other end, in, in the medical school, where the students, in this case, um, in, in Edinburgh, you'll see here, this is a, they're using WordPress for this. So the students are working on a topic, and they've created their own website, uh, explored and researched the topic, and this is now uh, available, as their, first of all, as their assignment, uh, and then available to all of the other students in their peer group, and to subsequent students. Uh, they can go into this database here and 
and see what each of their peer group has been, been working on. And it's all different. It's individual and it's a different topic that they've taken. So that sort of shared learning and peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, really, really quite important. From an assessment point of view, obviously you're looking at the student's ability to research a topic, synthesize that information, present it clearly. And that's, this is young students. This is not senior, senior students. You know, there's young students in terms of just beginning to get those skill sets in, in place. So they, it's used for all of these things. I'm, I'm conscious that I'm just keeping an eye on the time, so I'll skip over some of these, and you can read them either quickly or at your le leisure uh, later. The portfolio pedagogy, uh, broken down, there's an action of some shape or form. Uh, there's the student's interaction with that information, uh, to, to create or try and solve problem solving, some aspect. There's then a curation of that to, to having explored, explored more expansively the material, to select it down and present. And at this point, um, presenting, beg your pardon, I'm looking at the wrong slide, presenting it in a, in, a, in a curated form. And then reflection on that learning. And in this model, what certainly my, my colleagues and, and myself have been guilty of in, in a past, is we spend a lot of time on the action, creation, and selection. This is the crit and tutorial point at the bottom. And then we would zip back up to the top and start the next project. And actually, we really should have been spending much more time unpacking the learning that has just taken place with the student. So instead of being fixated on, we're on to the next project, um, spending time to actually pull this together um, and let the students then unpack what it is they think they've learned. And quite an interesting litmus test of learning is that if, let's say, you had a task or assignment that was over the duration of five weeks, if you were to ask the students at the end of five weeks what they know now and what they can do now that they couldn't do at the beginning five weeks earlier, that immediately will tell you whether or not that five weeks has been productive. But again, it's kind of simple. You know, so we started five weeks ago, we're, we're at week five, what, do you, what have you learned? And that will give you a measure of value added. So this is the, the full, full map um, in terms of the different types of tasks, teaching, stimulus, task, research, thinking, making, and so on in this model. Now, this portfolio model, which certainly um, with an, an online system now makes this really uh, possible, is time and date stamped, and it's cyclical. So this goes round and round and round and round as time is moving forward with the various tasks that you're introducing to the, to the students. Okay. Digital technologies, and we'll spin through this quite quickly. All of this has changed for, for us, and, and certainly in education and in higher education, has changed dramatically in terms of the function, I would argue, of higher education, as well as um, the how we do it. And it, it's, you'll see how this has changed in terms of the, the key points to this, but we're globally connected everywhere. So students can get information, access to information almost instantly in real time from anywhere in the world. And it's no longer static. So the big shift is when it became mobile. Um, we've had the computers with us for, for a, a wee while now, but it, the mobile and the Wi-Fi has made a big difference to this. So this is commonplace in terms of lecture theatres uh, around this, and whether What's interesting about this slide is we don't know whether they're just using the laptops to take notes or whether it's genuinely interactive with, with the instructors. But this is what changed everything, is when you go mobile and we're now on these kind of touch screens, flat screens with Wi-Fi. And just while I have another sip of water, um, can you remember how far, how long ago it was that the iPhone was introduced? When was it introduced? Can you remember a time when we didn't have it? We didn't have tablets. <laughs> Would we like to go back to that time? When we, when, yeah. I mean, it, it hasn't all been brilliant, that's for sure, because it, it has changed lots of things. It's changed expectations. It's certainly changed the way that we can do things. But it was only 2007 
um, that this was introduced. So a little more than a decade, and it's just transformed everything. And the big change, certainly, was, is the Wi-Fi. And with the, the really important word there isn't Wi-Fi. It's the one that says free Wi-Fi. And this is a coffee shop just in the heart of the campus of, of Edinburgh University, going back about 2012. And you can see that the students are, are already beginning to use this, uh, use the, the technology. A brew lab shut down the Wi-Fi at lunchtime. They shut it down for two hours because otherwise students would just stay there all day. <laughs> and, and so the socialized learning, because it is, it's for, it is real, it's not. I mean, okay, they're going to have coffee and chat about all manner of things. But this was in, in Singapore where I was in, in August uh, 2018, and there's Starbucks. And it's, this is serious study space for the students because they can't find the kind of space to work in groups necessarily easily uh, on campus. So thinking about, again, the context of how students are, are, are operating and working uh, legitimately, not just because they don't want to be uh, in class, uh, as you can see here, this, this is a serious study time for them. For the institution, um, this has meant there's expectations, there's certainly a, a big lift in expectation of which students just assume will be there. And that has changed all proportion. And my experience is that institutions are struggling to keep up with where their students think this, this why, why don't you have X, Y, or Z, because that should just be the case. And so, so that graph is, is going vertical in terms of what the student ex expectations are of how they should be supported. But generally, this list um, would be, be fairly conventional, I think, in terms of what students would, would expect. For, this, for instructors and the institution, as these systems are introduced, what they mustn't do is to make our life more difficult. So they, they just can't, that's, that's just not going to work. So, and, and neither should it. So for, for staff, these systems must be seen to add value. If they don't add value, no, nobody will use them. The students won't. The students will not use them. And students will make a direct comparison between commercial products that have got nothing to do with education and how they function, and your on-campus uh, offerings. And if your on-campus offerings are not designed as well and efficient and easy to use, then the students will grumble about them because they're not just not as good as things that they're accustomed to uh, off-campus. Now, there's a change for education, and, and, and we all see that. Um, there's various studies that are, there's links that you, when you have the slides, you can click these links and go into to various studies. But this was one on the GISC, which is the is JISC is the um, organization that provide Edurome and the backbone for all of the universities across um, UK. And um, they do a lot of work on, on uh, the dig using digital tools to, to improve learning experience. But more importantly, what employers are saying, of course, is that they need graduates because the world is changing so quickly. They need graduates with different kinds of skills. So all things digital. And as a consequence, everything has changed. And this is the skill set coming out of various studies by 2030. These are the kind of skills that um, are predicted that employers are going to need more of. And that's because our traditional forms of either the service sector or the manufacturing sector or the retail sector, all of it has changed. You know, online, if you look at that, you know, but four companies are uh, taking all of the money <laughs> up to one point. And um, those four companies have changed the models for pretty much everything. And as a consequence, the kinds of jobs that our graduates would have been going into are, are not those jobs anymore. Now, it doesn't mean to say that, that the graduates won't get employment, but the employment will be different, and the kinds of employment um, will re require different kinds of skill sets. Now, you all know how long it takes to go from the start of a program to introducing a program, getting your graduates in and finish your undergraduate degree. That's a long time out that you need to start saying, actually, over here, this is, you know, this is what needs to be taught. This, this is what needs to be important for the students. And this is where I would argue 
that the most important thing that we can do in universities is to help, obviously, students will come because they're interested in a particular subject. Fine, and as they should be. Those subjects will, will, will change as well. But the most important thing we can do for our students is to teach them to learn how to learn. Because that's what they're going to have to do quickly when they graduate. So yes, they will have to learn a, a subject and study a subject that they're interested in. But in parallel, learning to learn is even more important, I would argue, that it's certainly you could afford to take the odd lecture or so out, although I had difficulty with my colleagues in Edinburgh when I suggested such a thing. But you, we need to just be coming back on how much knowledge we're trying to get students to cover, because it's finite. They're only here for a, a relatively, in their lifetime, a short period of time. And, that, and during that period of time, they need to be ready to learn to learn for the rest of their lives. So it's those learn to learn skills that are really quite important. And you can see these are skills coming up in terms of what's, what's important. And the fourth industrial revolution. And if you look at um, what's happening over here, it's the little Wi-Fi symbols against industry the artificial intelligence and the cyber-physical systems. So this is a big, big shift in terms of the, 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 the shape of the world. Now, I know that Waterloo is, is part of the U15 group in terms of research-intensive universities. I'm going to speed through these because I need to get onto the slicks. Um, the, the Russell group, we're looking at, well, why, why would students choose to study at a research-intensive institution? And these were some of the, the study points that they were looking at. Is it because this is the kind of learning that uh, a research intensive institution can provide and it's what's, uh, these attributes are, are regarded uh, highly by em employers. And this is already a few years ago. This is um, maybe 2011, by that kind of time. And then when we started looking at Edinburgh, at the, the curriculum as to what that should look like or could look like, I'm going to speed through these. You'll get all the slides. Um, and this then eventually got us to the independent learning of the slicks. Yeah, there you go. And online, you'll, you'll be able to access the, the website for the slicks themselves. And there's video, video clips of the students talking about their experiences and how it's all functioned and uh, shaped here. And you'll have the... The, the links for these to, to look at it. But what we're trying to do with the slicks was to address some of the points in the future curriculum and those points that the Russell Group in particular were talking about, that students would have multiple learning experiences. All of our students would experience at least one course online uh, as part of their time at, at university. And giving students, our student association were particularly uh, vocal about we need to be given the chance to create aspects of our own learning. They were very, very keen. It was part of the, the, the partnership agenda. And they wanted to, to have the opportunity to create their own learning. Um, and what it does within the SLICs is it puts the student and their mentor at the center of the process rather than, um, rather than just something that's done to the student, if you like, coming to, to attend their classes. So the course designed for 21st century learners, uh, the, what came out of that study for the university is that going forward, all courses would, in the curriculum would head towards student-centered. And that's, again, that you would read that anywhere in terms of, of the literature. But importantly, that they would move away from passive learning styles. So if you, again, if I throw out that challenge and just say, well, change your course so that it's not passive which means that we can't do what we're doing today. I'm not going to just, you're sitting there and I'm going to talk, <laughs> talking at you. So we shouldn't be doing that. Um, so university-wide framework. Here's the slicks itself. It was really important that this was not department by department, discipline by discipline. It was whole university. And the reason that it's a whole university framework is there is no need for any individual department to think that they had to do it differently because the student will actually contextualize the content to their subject and to their department. So it didn't need to be a different model. Input from staff was deliberately minimal. This is the students doing everything. Academic input at the front end. Um, 
key role for the academics were to approve the projects that students then proposed. This is the slimmed down version of how it works. So I'll come over here and just have a, a look at this. So on the left hand side, um, the students identify their learning experience. They put their proposal to their, to their tutors and they move on. Once this has been approved, they then go on to manage the project. Students self-assess formatively, staff summatively assess, and then there's a feedback review at the end. And this is a more detailed breakdown of what's going on in terms of the experiencing, the reflecting, the creating, and reporting, and acting. And then inside the Slick Online Framework, you simply could not do this with paper. It's just not possible. You need to have a, a model inside a, a learning platform that will allow students to, to um, interact with their tutors from wherever they are. And you'll see from the student outputs, they were all over the world undertaking this uh, project. Now, this is where it's difficult because we're now screen grabs from, from the PebblePad platform and it's the version prior to the one that you will have, which, it, which Edinburgh now has, but the, the uh, screen grabs are from the middle version. And this is what it looks like. Down the left hand side, you'll see the tabs, and these tabs are all, as you would expect on a website, in the workbook, this giving the students access to different areas of resources. And the interesting thing about PebblePad as a platform, it's also, as Shane, who's the chief exec of, of PebblePad, will acknowledge, is that what frightens everyone about it is that when you open it up, there's nothing there. And that's, <laughs> and that's because you have to design the learning, and of course, that's its strength because you have to build your workbook the way that you, pedagogically, the way that you want the students to work through. So the slick workbook inside PebblePad is what makes it special in terms of the way it's working. And what you're seeing here is what the students would see as they, as they go through the workbook. I've tried to make sense of it so you can see this is the journey that the students will go through. And these red slides are telling you what's going on at the different stage, uh, stages uh, uh, of the process. So as I say, I'm not going to spend much time on this because I think it would be more profitable to get to the end and then you can ask some questions. So forgive me if I just zip through some of these. So you can see the structure, proposal and time plan. The students will propose. And if you think about students, a capstone project or a dissertation, uh, you're accustomed, this model is not unique because students will propose their topic of study, and you'll you say that's fine, or not, and they, they will then go off and write their dissertation with some supervision, and then submit it, and then you'll assess it. And the only difference is that for dissertation, read anything in terms of the evidence that's submitted for the slick. When the student submits their proposal, in their proposal, they have to um, say the learning outcomes are fixed, so they have to say, this is the evidence, this is my proposal, and this is the evidence that I will submit for assessment in order to achieve those learning objectives. You as the instructor simply look at what they're proposing and say yes if or no. If they submit what they say they're going to submit, I can assess that they've, they've managed, uh, they've met those learning objectives. And that's the premise, that's the top and tail of it in terms of, of what they're doing. So, We'll zip through these. You'll be able to read the screen, screens as we go uh, when you get the, the information to you. Working through from the student view, very similar because PebblePad on both views looks similar from the staff to the, to the students. Um, scrolling pages as it goes through page one and page two and page three. So this is identifying the evidence. And you can, so here, yeah, so that's the student, uh, various tick box areas that the student can say, I've completed these f the first three parts of the, of the process and so on. You can then attach any other, any URL. So a student can fall out of PebblePad to go to anywhere you want them to go simply by a hyperlink and then drop straight back into it. So any resources that you have available, the student will go, in this case, to our careers department, also to the equivalent of CTE as Institute for Academic Development. So they prepared a lot of material about uh, project management, uh, for, or, or in terms of writing their proposals, so the whole induction for um, the slicks 
when we first did it, it was conducted face to face uh, over three days, and now it's still face to face a little bit, but a lot of the a lot of the induction is now online. So this is taking them to areas like career planning. Um, also to my world of work in terms of developing the various skill sets of so various websites that the university would uh, link into, and then the proposal ready for the slick itself. So this is information that's been provided by the Institute for Academic Development in terms of understanding reflective learning and experiential learning. So all of this is provided for the student as they work through. And this is into the new interface which was just last week, and you can see the templates for assessment for the student self-assessment. The private box, um, we had to do, again, build this into the workbook. When the students submit their self-assessment, the staff can't see it. So the, the students submit, the administrating layer can see it, but, the, but the, the instructors can't when the students submit. And then, so down the left-hand column, there are all of the areas that you can see that the student can click and go directly. So very simple structure in terms of, of uh, where they can get to. Now, student output, and I'm also going to go through this also really quickly, but you can see the variety of information, uh, uh, variety of uh, types of projects that the students were, were engaged with. So from the business school, looking at the various theories on project management, the internship with Conigo Phillips by uh, Oivand Oswald, he was intrigued by the cyclical nature of the oil and gas industry, boom and bust, as the price of oil goes up. And when it's down, people are made redundant, and then staff are. So he was looking at what were the issues of maintaining the expertise uh, in the sector. And so they're keeping the, the, the websites, um, web folios, and you can see down the left hand the reports and documents uh, as they go through. Uh, midway summer report, uh, a midway semester report uh, through, the, through the period. Luxury, luxury leather goods market in South Korea, and the business student here was intrigued by the fact that the products were being produced for uh, nothing. And as soon as the brand went on the leather product, they were costing a fortune. And it was this issue of, of um, fair trade, basically, in terms of, of the workers not really getting paid. So these business students, so look at, looking all over the world, and she was working in the company and understanding how the products were, were actually made, made all the products, and then looking at the, the issues. And I think was horrified in terms of what she found, basically. Uh, HR supply chain in the Norwegian Armed Forces. So, um, and the work they're doing there. Uh, business student who decided to look at a business, to, to, for, the proposition would be for a, a tourism website and uh, how a better uh, shop window into Edinburgh and all the things you should do in Edinburgh. And one of the measures that she set for herself, a measure of success, was using all the digital technologies and was how many followers she would get on the various blogs. So she had bloggers and thousands ended up uh, following her on the Exploring Edinburgh website. Um, internship in the Obama White House with so Brittany. So it was all about Congress and the voting. And then her favorite one was her, her selfie with uh, Cory Booker in terms of what she was in. So when you start, so these, the, these are their web folios, um, their experiences, uh, their evidence as they were building things up. Iceland exped expedition, looking at the various studies, um, understanding. What he was looking at in the Iceland expedition was why it was important, why trying to understand Mars as a planet was important geologically. So, but in Iceland comes into the, to the uh, bacterial diversity of terrestrial crystalline volcanic rocks in, I in Iceland. And uh, this student then was running surveys uh, with his expedition team on himself. So he was asking the team uh, to complete the survey as to how well his, what they thought his contribution was to the, to the team effort. So surveys, so you can get a feel for, this is wonderful, this is one of the medical students obviously working on placement also into uh, brain tumors, cancer issues, and these are all uh, uh, CAT scan data. 
And what he was then interested in doing, and it's all handwritten, as you can see here, was these were the skills that he'd learned or improved upon during his slick. So the students are, this highly reflective element, as well as conducting the project, is very much part uh, of it. Again, same here, uh, week by week, building up um, their understanding of how they themselves as a student learned. And what was fascinating listening to the students was how the slick had impacted on their time, not just when they did the slick, but how it had changed the way that they studied, saw themselves as a student further on in the system. And this one is just, again, it's photos, videos, any media type, any form of, of media, whether it's linking to YouTube or anything else, all of that is harnessed inside the portfolio platform. So there's no restriction. If you can see it in a, in a web page, in a computer screen, then you can build that into the, to the system. Um, this student uh, discovered a new species while she was there up the Amazon with the, uh, with the team. And uh, so she had a very, a very uh, successful uh, time, as you might say. Now, critical reflection. I'm only going to pick up one or two things here. He, what you're seeing on the right-hand side now uh, is the feedback. There's Peter and myself, Peter Moles and me, with this student. And there's the feedback on directly in, in their project. And then here is the student feeding back on the feedback that we'd given. So that's that closing that loop of the model inside the system. And these sub-windows pop up related to as they, as they come up as you go through the, uh, the project work. And then on here, there's your learning outcomes and the grades assigned in the assessment. And it's the profile of grading. In this case, it's an A student. I'm going to whip through this. We were just about finished of time, Catherine. Yeah, five minutes. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's what I've got on screen. <laughs> so you can see you can see the challenge here was to let you have enough of this that you can see. But please go through it, and you, you'll you'll make sense of what's going on. Importantly, this is what I wanted to let you see. So the first pilot. Um, this was the marking grid for the two markers who marked independently of each other, and then the student who over at the student assessment, the right-hand side. And this was the correlation on the first pilot <coughs> of student self-assessment and the agreed grade and the automatically ge generated from this grid over on the left. And it's giving you pretty much, um, I think it's 96% if you, do the, if you want to do it in numbers, student correlation between the tutor assessment and the staff assessment and the staff couldn't see what the tutors were, uh, what the students were um, assessing. So, but we knew that we'd be quite close to that from earlier, earlier studies. So, if you teach the students to self-assess, actually they can do it really, really well. And you could easily get to a point, as we do in the Edinburgh Award, which doesn't carry credit, but the Edinburgh Award, the students actually do assess themselves as a peer group model using adaptive comparative judgment system. So this is why the assessment and feedback and then the portfolio pedagogy is sort of important to get this, all of the components in place to move towards this self-designed learning. And finally, are the slicks scalable? Um, which is a conversation that Catherine and I had. And well, yeah, this is a, an Erasmus-funded European project which Edinburgh is leading on called NICE, the website, again, you can go into it. This is a big poster, which I've had to subdivide. I wanted to let you see the poster. I've subdivided it so you can see it. So we're starting with 1, 2, 3, Lund, Edinburgh, Dublin, Padova, Salamanca, Gottingen, Amsterdam, and Yash uh, universities. There's 160 students starting this project, and they're going down to groups of five, looking at um, big world issues, global issues of food security, uh, climate change, uh, secure societies, Europe in a changing world, smart green integrated transport, health, 
and secure, efficient and clean energy. So these were the big topics that the students are working on. They're working in cross-university groups of five. Um, the whole thing is sitting inside the slick framework when they get to the group of five. So this is the, the team-based version. And then they will end up, hopefully, successfully, they all pass um, with uh, credit from uh, University of Edinburgh. And this was in January. So this is in real time. If you look at the timeline, uh, we're in, that's where we will be later on. So January here is the point they're at, getting to uh, selecting their teams. And this is uh, the group in, in Amsterdam in January uh, working and presenting to each other on the various topics as the teams are being brought together. And here, importantly, is Simon with the red arrow. And Simon Riley, now co-director of the Slicks, uh, he's a medic, and Gavin. And Gavin's our employability consultant. And both Gavin and Simon have kindly said, not a problem for Waterloo to get in touch and uh, talk to them about the Slicks, which I, I think will, will happen via Catherine. Kath and um, final slide. This is from the Amsterdam session in January, which I thought was quite uh, interesting, uh, what we said earlier on. I'm sorry that that's two minutes for <laughs> questions. <laughs> we should have let a little bit low. No But is this the intention to use Slex across all kinds of courses at all levels, or is the idea really to use it in a select few? So the, the, the question is, um, are we using Slex across all courses or in, in select uh, places? Yeah. Um, first of all, the Slex were introduced as an elective um, model. So. To, to, to start, you can imagine that we, we would not move to this model immediately across the university. So the slicks were introduced um, as additional credit, so they're optional, and it was all pilot-based to get it started. Um, what has happened, however, is that colleagues have seen the model, because they could see their students were all, uh, you wish to undertake the, the, the slick. So the slicks now form um, a core part of the elective um, menu in terms of students picking them. But what colleagues have started doing is taking bits of their program and designing it into the slick framework. So, you know, the engineers and the chemists and so on say, so that would work for our, our workbook. So the, the engineers for uh, the students go out on placement. So the framework will, that, that's much better than the way we do it at the moment. So this will give us a framework for the students to, for their placement. So now you have slick variants, which are, they're using the framework because it's already there, but it's now specific to the discipline for a particular purpose in terms of that model. So to answer your question, it's not replacing everything. It's, it's available as an elective for all students across all disciplines. So it is, it is university-wide. Um, currently, we have probably have 150 medical students who manage their, uh, some of their practice elements are managed now through the slick framework. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. So I have a question which goes back to a very early slide that you had where you reversed the and, and student on top sort of driving our learning. Yeah. Oh, wow. Love that. OK. Yeah. Um, and here's my challenge with all of this, and it comes back to sort of a standard organizational behavior type thing, which is if the outcomes are not aligned with the intentions, the, the intentions often get overridden. And what do I mean by this? Well, we like to think we're teaching, you know, we want the students to learn, but realistically, the outcomes of their degree for many of them and the marks that they get are uh, co-op opportunities, uh, choice jobs, uh, potential uh, access to graduate programs, access to medical programs and whatever. And so while we say, well, we want it to all be about learning and that if we just have the students, you know, kind of running the learning, the institutional outcomes, 
but, but there's something other than the institutional outcomes, which are the actual outcomes of the degree in terms of the student's future. And, and yeah. they're much more focused on that than they say were in my day or possibly your day when we were undergraduate students. And I'm just wondering how you feel, because this is, a, the, I mean, I really want the students to learn. And I've yeah. even run courses where I tell them I'm not going to give you a mark yeah. until the course is over, which I don't think is university policy. So hopefully that's not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> I, I am, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, d d to clarify, um, unless you want the students to write the learning outcomes, the academics are in charge. So the slicks, so the first time a student undertakes a slicks, we've written the, the learning outcomes. So nothing changes. So in terms of your course or program ob objectives, anything the student has to learn, you need them to learn certain things or competencies have to be met. You're in charge, that's what you assess. What, this, what I'm saying here is that the, the two things is that in order to get the student to really understand what it is you're trying to get them to learn, if asking the student to put the, put the learning outcome that you've written, to put that into their own words, helps them. That's all. It's not, it's not, it's, they're not changing the learning outcome. They're not deciding they don't like what you want them to learn. They're going to learn something else, uh, which does happen, I suppose, in many cases, that students w w would desire to do that. But what we're, what we're trying to do is to give them a framework where we want them to learn certain things, but and this is now this, talking about the slick. So we want the student to learn certain things. Here's the learning objectives. But what we're saying to the student, you decide how you're going to manage, to, how you're going to get to that point. We'll help you, but you decide how you're going to get to that point. And, so, and the students take to it instantly. Oh, well, I want to do this. I've always wanted to do this particular project that I'm interested in, whatever it might be, politics, or it doesn't matter. This is what I'm interested in. And their challenge is to say, here's what I'm interested in. You've given me those learning objectives. And this is how this project, this is how I will evidence that learning for you. It's you then, you then say, well, no, that won't do it. Now, what you've proposed is not going to, it'll, it'll satisfy learning outcome one and two, but it won't address number three. So then there's a discussion about, but if you run a, a a study, qualitative study, or the, with this evidence, then that would do. So you, you would have that discussion and then decide what that other bit needed. What I didn't say and should have, of course, is that once they've finished all of the portfolio and finished the project, the students have a 1,500 to 2,000 word report, reflective report. And in that report, they've already assessed themselves. And in the report, they have to evidence uh, they have to, to demonstrate in the report what evidence they used from their portfolio to give themselves the grades that they gave themselves. So they're having to justify the learning profile. So if I give myself an A, a B, and a C uh, for the learning outcomes, I have to demonstrate what evidence I used that justified the A, B, and C. If, I mean, the other thing, is, which is terrific, is as soon as the student gives themselves anything other than an A, it's win-win. Even if they give themselves three A's, it's a starting point for a conversation. But if they give themselves an A, B, and a C, already they've decided that there's something that could have been better against the criterion. And that then forms the, that's where, for me, that's where the learning actually takes place, is in, is in that space. But you're in charge of, of the students. Don't just say, well, we're doing what we want. That's why the word framework is really important. That learning framework is under the control of the academics. And you approve the academic validity of every proposal that the student uh, uh, puts forward. This point is a little bit different, right. which is um, what I was trying to put across here is that for a long, long time, we're accustomed to using assessment, or, or many institutions use assessment to measure at the end of the process. And that's what the university records. Now, you can do that. And that's all you ever do, is measure at the end of the process and record it. And what I'm saying is that if you change the way that you, de that you deal with assessment and design assessment to help students learn, you will automatically be able to do what the institution needs in terms of recording a mark at the end. Because you're still, you're still grading the students. And yeah. I agree with that, but it 
it's it's still that fun. So so first of all, to yeah. go back to the original, I, I mean, I, I love the idea of the slate. So and uh, I, I can already see some uses for it. I love some of the feedback on feedback, yeah. which I think is brilliant. And I haven't done that, and I think I'll apply that. I think there's lots of learning I can yeah. get out of this, but there is this structural issue, which it's not that the university gets what it needs because they're almost irrelevant. Yeah. Um, it's that what the outcome, so, so there was that why don't students like assessment uh, and why is there such a disconnect? Yeah. And I think part of it is because we have the focus on learning faculty at university. We have the focus on learning students, but the, but the use of that is not learning. It's all sorts of other things. And that's kind of a, a larger mm. institutional, kind of like a meta problem that we all have to yeah. deal with. Agreed. It's not. I mean, it's not easy. But 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 just to re, to reassure you that it's th this model is not. We're not giving up anything the, in terms of guiding the student to, to where we need them to be. That it's not the, the students are having to, to evidence that they, they will meet whatever it is you wherever you're setting the standards. Yeah. yeah, totally agree. yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jason. Um, yeah, I, was wondering, I think I think I saw as your slides are speeding by that the part of the reflection is a weekly blog post. And yeah. um, I, I, I like this idea of we're moving towards reflection in our co-op work terms and, and mm -hmm. the reports are getting like reflected. Um, so what I'm wondering is if you have any comments on designing reflection into courses. Like what makes, how big does the thing they need to reflect on need to be? How frequent should the reflection be? Like yeah. it's, it's a blog post, you know, it's kind of a now a narrative mm -hmm. written thing. Yeah. I know this is a very, very broad mm -hmm. question, but yeah. just, I'd be interested in the insights. Yeah, okay. Um, so if we look, focus on the slick first of all, and then I'll maybe draw on other examples from my own, own background in, in the arts. Um, we didn't ask the students to reflect necessarily in detail while they were going through their project. We, what we asked them to do, or suggested they did, because the, we, we kept it quite open in terms of the students finding what was the appropriate pattern for themselves. What we suggested they did is that they, they, they recorded and posted and blogged frequently. And we suggested, it probably at least weekly, that you would summarize. Otherwise, you might forget if you'd been off for two months or whatever. So it would be sensible to do that. But then we left it to the student as to, to, to how often they, they did. Now, what was, used, what was interesting about that, of course, is inside Pebblepad, it's time and date stamped. So we know if it was done the night before or if it was done regularly, if it was done every day and when it was done in terms of the recording of that information. But in the final, in the reflective report, which they had, they had um, part of the induction session was understanding the, the kind of reflections that we were asking them to, to have a go at, because these are young students, second, second year undergraduate, and um, right at the beginning of their second year, so just right in the end of first year. And what, the, what we were asking them to reflect upon was the experience themselves that they, they'd gone through, and that was really fascinating, because students were saying, I didn't realize I was so disorganized, and I need to be much more organized in the way I manage my time, and time ran away with me, and, and so on. And it was understanding just how they themselves, as a person, needed to function, in, the, in this case, inside education. But it was, it was broader than that. So that happened, and was, was, you could see the plus points. When they got to the reflective report itself, they had to then, as I, as I was saying, they had to demonstrate the grade profile that they, they gave them against the assessment criterion. They then had to put into words explicitly why they gave themselves those grades, supported by what evidence inside their portfolio. Now, the good students, and they were all, I mean, they were self self-selected for, for the, these pilots, so they were, they were very, very keen students and top students, which is why the profile looks the way it does. But they, um, they were then justifying, well, I, I didn't think this was the top grade because, in fact, I, I don't have the grade up, but one student gave themselves three straight Cs as just as satisfactory. And that's what it was. And yet, that student 
we then felt guilty because the more, she learned more on the project than all the others put together. But yet the project was worth what she gave. She awarded herself the correct grade. Did they get any credit for kind of quality of production? Well, they didn't in that first one, okay. but they do now. <laughs> because as soon as we saw, this is crazy, because, this, because she actually, you could argue that she was the A-star student because she really understood where the deficiencies were and she just would not do it that way again. And so she'd, she'd gone head first into that project, got quite a bit of it wrong, and, but then realized through the, reflection, through the reflection at the end. And that's where the, where the real power came. So we've obviously tweaked all of that since so that we, the staff can then award uh, out with the self-assessment um, appropriate um, grading for, for the reflection. But I th in discussing it with colleagues, reflection's not easy. What used to happen going back to the art schools is they would have their crit you would present and you would, you would get in instant feedback on the crit from your peer group and your tutors and it was then off you go over the weekend and reflect on it. And th you know, it doesn't happen like that. So we have to help students learn how to reflect. It's, it's probably the only thing I can say is it's not, it, again, it's an iterative process and practices would be quite important. So I know that this could go on I know. for quite a long time, <laughs> uh, but I will have the slides. And um, thank you so much for your, your time and um, have a full day planned with Ian. So I'm going to take and let him have some lunch and then get him back. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.